Session 22, Divisions Among Christians, the hymn to Jesus Christ, our Sovereign King. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O God, grant us a spirit of wisdom and insight to know you clearly. Enlighten our innermost vision that we may know the great hope to which you have called us, the wealth of your glorious heritage to be distributed among the members of the Church, and the immeasurable scope of your power in us who believe, through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, for ever and ever. Amen. A reading from St. Paul's second letter to Timothy. I charge you, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingly power, Proclaim the word, be persistent, whether it is convenient or inconvenient. Convince, reprimand, encourage, with all patience and teaching. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but following their own desires and insatiable curiosity, will accumulate teachers and will stop listening to the truth and will be diverted to myths. But you... Be self-possessed in all circumstances, put up with hardship, perform the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's subject, Divisions Among Christians, is one of the saddest realities in our world, that Christians should be divided the night before he died, Christ prayed that all might be one. And in this letter from St. Paul to his beloved brother bishop, brother friend, he writes, Be persistent, whether it is convenient or inconvenient. Convince, reprimand, and encourage with all patience and teaching. Divisions among Christians are the result of human sins. 
for which, often enough, people of, on both sides were to blame. However, people who are brought up in communities that are already separated from the church are not guilty of the sin of separation. Accordingly, the Catholic Church accepts them with respect and affection as brothers in Christ, for their baptism makes them members of his mystical body. Much holiness and truth can be found in these communities, such as the scriptures, supernatural life, faith, hope, and charity, and other gifts of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Catholic Church views any other religion as a search for God and considers any goodness and truth found there to be a gift from God and a preparation for the gospel, the good news. Nevertheless, the Church asserts that God continues to call the whole of humanity together into his Son's Church. In fact, she claims that all salvation comes from Christ the Head through the Church, which is his body. This claim does not lessen the Church's sincere respect for other religions. It rules out the idea that one religion is as good as another. Therefore, no one could be saved if he knew that Christ had founded the Catholic Church and refused to enter into it or to remain in it. However, people who, through no fault of their own, do not know Christ and his Church may be saved in ways that only God knows. If they sincerely seek him and try to do his will. In her relations with Judaism, the Church never forgets that God chose the Jews and in, as his own people and gave them the law, the covenants, and the promises. Moreover, when God's Son became a man for our salvation, he became a Jew. As for Muslims, the Church acknowledges that God's plan of salvation includes all those who acknowledge the Creator and adore the one merciful God, our Judge on the Last Day. When Father and I first started teaching RCIA, and later when we taught this course, um, it was Father's idea that we never condemn anybody who thinks differently from the church, but that we simply teach what the church teaches, rather than focusing on the errors that some people make, we focus on the truth that the church teaches. But one year, you were still at All Saints, so it was quite early on when we started teaching. One year, um, we did such a good job that three or four women who were intending to become Catholic at Easter came to us and said, but you've done, you haven't told us yet why we should become Catholics rather than United or Presbyterian or Anglican. So we decided to put this talk in to simply give the history, again, not to um, apportion blame, but simply to give the history of why there are divisions among Christians. So that's what this represents. One of the books we've relied on particularly is the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church. This is published by the University of Oxford, which is not anymore Catholic. It was founded as a Catholic university, but hasn't been for many centuries now. But it does an amazingly good job. I think you found it first, didn't you, Father? Yes. A very, very good job of stating what the different divisions among Christians 
hold to be true. Certainly when they give the, um, the Catholic understanding of anything, it's very accurate. And they, again, don't apportion blame or try to decide why it's there, but simply give the facts. Try to show this is the Catholic point of view, this is the Anglican point of view, this is the Presbyterian yeah. point of view. One of the, talking about show, arguing and pointing what's wrong, I've always maintained that it's much better to just show what's right than what is wrong here and there, because there's an infinite number of things which are wrong. For instance, two and two are not five, two and two are not seven, two and two are not 55. You can go on forever showing what's not right. Much better to just say two and two are four. So um, you'll see in the footnotes how often we've referred to the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church. At his Last Supper, Jesus prayed for his apostles. Then he added, I do not pray for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their word, that all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you. I pray that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I living in them, you living in me, that their unity may be complete. But the unity of Christ's church has been broken repeatedly. There are now tens of thousands of different Christian denominations in the United States alone. And right, yes. And right now, um, various Christian church communities are breaking up over new issues. For example, in, um, uh, you know that lady who spoke to us when we went into Tim Hortons on our way to um, mission. Her church, where she is, now has two, is it St. Christopher or St. Paul? I can't remember. But one is broken into two. One of them is now S.T. Paul or Christopher, whichever it is. And the other one is S.A.I.N.T. Then, of course, there are disputes over property. It's, it's tragic. Um, and what Father was just pointing to, um, Father and a priest friend went to um, the no. funeral of Archbishop Exner in Saskatchewan, and they passed through Melville. Melville, is that where you stopped for the night? Yes. Okay, and they give you a list of 14 different Christian churches in Melville alone, which is a small community. Very small town. Um, I myself, last time I was in the Olympic Peninsula, here's a pay, uh, again, given in, um, made available in a, a motel. The top one is different Christian ecclesial communities, church communities in, in uh, Squim, the, the bottom half in Port Angeles. And the interesting thing is that when you look at these names, any one of them could be applied to the Catholic Church. Baptist, yes, we believe in baptism. Bible, yes, we believe in the Bible. The Church of Christ, yes, we believe that's what the Catholic Church is. The Church of God, ditto. Community Church, yes, we believe we are the body of Christ. Episcopal. Yes, we have bishops. Evangelical. Yes, we read the Bible. Nazarene. Yes, we follow Christ who came from Nazareth. And so on and so on. It's very... How have they all branched off in their own direction, emphasizing one reality or another? Yeah. Anyway, Christ sent 11 apostles. Remember that Judas had betrayed him and hanged himself. To, set, to preach the gospel to all nations. From the start, then, there was diversity in the church, bringing richness, but also danger. Peter went to Antioch in what is now Turkey, and then Rome. Historians think that Matthew preached to the Hebrews. Andrew was martyred at Patras in Achaia, now Greece. John went to Ephesus in Asia Minor, now Turkey. 
Thomas to India or perhaps Parthia, now Iran, Philip to Asia Minor, Bartholomew to Armenia, and Simon and Jude to Persia, now Iran. As they went, the apostles handed on their powers to their successors. For example, they elected Matthias to succeed Judas. Paul ordained Timothy. Thus there grew up the various local or particular churches, or dioceses as we would now say. Each had its own language, its own style of celebrating the sacraments, and its own bishop, whose powers could be traced back to one of the apostles. But before long disagreements arose, sometimes causing divisions called schisms. The word comes from the Greek word to tear or rend. Occasionally, individuals or groups would apostatize, abandon Christianity completely. As time went on, people began to drift away from the truth. That is, some people. The earliest heresies, from the Greek word for I take away, were about Jesus Christ. The Catholic Church has always taught that he is one and the same person as God the Son, truly, fully, and perfectly God, and truly, fully, and perfectly man, possessing the nature of God and the nature of man. However, Paul of Samosata, who was Bishop of Antioch at one point, held that Jesus is God's Son by adoption, not by nature. The church deposed Paul from his see, his diocese, his bishopric, and condemned his heresy in synods at Antioch, synods being meetings of bishops in union with the Pope. Arius, a priest of Alexandria in Egypt, taught that God the Son was of a different substance from the Father. The church condemned this heresy at the First Ecumenical Council of Nicaea, in 325, ecumenical meaning worldwide. The Nicene Creed, written at this council, says that the Son of God is consubstantial with the Father, which is what we say every time we recite the Nicene Creed. Nestorius, Bishop of Constantinople, now Istanbul, said that Christ was two persons, a human person joined to God the Son. The Church condemned this heresy at the Third Ecumenical Council at Ephesus in Turkey in 431. Various monophysites, the word comes from the Greek for one nature, claimed that Christ had only one nature, the divine nature, that he was not truly human. The Church condemned this heresy at the Fourth Ecumenical Council at Chalcedon in 451. These last two heresies led to schisms, separating the churches in Syria, Egypt, and Ethiopia from the others. Most of the apostles, as you may have noticed, preached in countries where Greek was spoken. Our earliest copies of the New Testament are in Greek, and so are the writings of the early church fathers. I should just define that. I'm looking at footnote 22. The fathers of the church are considered to be special witnesses to the faith because they lived not long after Christ. In the Western or Latin church, there were 39 of them, ending with Isidore of Seville in 636. In the Eastern or Greek church, there were 49, ending with John of Damascus in 749. Even in Rome, Greek was the church's language up to the third century. Until the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, there was still some Greek left in the Mass, Kyrie, eleison, Lord, have mercy, and Christe, eleison, Christ, have mercy. After the third century, differences in practice began to widen between the Greek-speaking East and the Latin-speaking West. For example, the East began to use leavened bread 
bread with yeast in it at Mass, while the West, following Jewish practice, continued to use unleavened bread. However, all the churches, all the dioceses, still acknowledged the Pope's primacy. When disagreements arose, the Pope acted as moderator by common consent. For example, in about 858, during a dispute about who should be patriarch, archbishop of Constantinople, one of the disputants asked Pope Nicholas I to send delegates. That is, asking a, a, Roman, a Latin speaking bishop of Rome to send delegates to settle a Greek speaking dispute. Nevertheless, disagreement between Rome and Constantinople continued, sowing the seeds of separation. For example, Constantinople began to question the church's insertion of the word filioque and the son in the Nicene Creed. As we told you when we talked about God, unity, and trinity, that dispute has been settled, thank God, but it lasted for a long time. Finally, in 1054, a papal legate or delegate declared the Patriarch of Constantinople excommunicate, no longer in communion with the others. And the Patriarch responded by declaring the Pope excommunicate. Each of them severed ties with the other. From this date, the schism between the Catholic Church and what came to be called the Eastern Orthodox Churches was complete. Today, Orthodox Churches differ from the Catholic Church in the following ways. They deny the Pope's jurisdiction over the whole Church and his infallibility in matters of faith and morals, which we spoke about in our talk on what is the Catholic Church. They accept him only as the Latin Patriarch. And looking at footnote 37, they themselves honor the Patriarch of Constantinople as the first among equals, but their various churches are more or less autocephalous, a Greek word meaning self-governing. They do not say filioque. They say the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father. They don't say and the Son in the Nicene Creed. They admit divorce after adultery or prolonged desertion, although reluctantly. They believe that Mary was born subject to original sin and not freed from its effects until the Annunciation. Catholics believe that she was not subject to original sin from the very first instant of her existence. They believe in Mary's assumption only as a tradition, not as a dogma. It's been a dogma for Catholics since 1950. They do not believe in indulgences, in helping each other atone for sin. You missed purgatory above there. And they do not believe in purgatory. Thank you, Father. However, the Orthodox do agree with Catholics in the following major areas. They recognize the powers of each other's priests and bishops. They've been handed down from the apostles. They celebrate all seven sacraments. They venerate Mary and the saints. They foster monasticism, the life of monks and nuns. They teach fundamentally the same theology. All who believe in Christ and are baptized properly enjoy a certain communion with the Catholic Church. With the Orthodox Churches, this communion is so profound that very little is needed before we can celebrate the Eucharist together. And we need to pray for that unity. We need unity. to pray for it. Now, between 1182 and 1930, more than a dozen groups of Eastern Orthodox came back into full communion with the Catholic Church. However, unfortunately, in 1946 and 1948, two of them reunited themselves with the Orthodox. However, the ones that stayed with the Catholic Church 
still celebrate the sacraments in the Eastern style. These people are said to belong to different rites, R-I-T-E-S, in the Catholic Church. They have a different ritual. There are six major rites, Alexandrian, Antiochene, Armenian, Byzantine, Chaldean, and Latin, with various subdivisions. And you very often find the word Catholic put after those. They have to keep stressing. Do you remember at Archbishop Exner's um, synod, he invited, I think, some Ukrainian Catholics. And they said, please, please, when you talk about us, make it clear that we are Catholics in union with the Pope. And Apparently they have union. to keep yes. they have to yes. keep stressing that because people keep thinking they're out on a limb somewhere. And the the diversity of rights and the different ways of expressing things yeah. are so so wonderful. It's it's a real gift, a real richness. The lower mainland in British Columbia is mostly Latin rite, but there are three other rites. There's the Ukrainian Catholic rite a subdivision of the Byzantine rite. Byzantium is another word, for, another name for Constantinople, now Istanbul. Now, I'm going to read what's written here, but we wrote this last July, I believe, and it's now out of date. We said it was currently without a bishop, which they call an eparch. But on November 18th, 2023, a new eparch or bishop was installed, eparch Michael Kwiatkowski. So they are no longer without their own eparch. No longer orphans, you might right. say. The diocese or eparchy of New Westminster covers British Columbia, Yukon Territory, and the Northwest Territory north of BC. So it's huge. They have five churches. Holy Eucharist Cathedral in New Westminster. Now, the cathedral, of course, is the seat of the eparch, cathedra being Latin, no, Greek, for seat. Holy Eucharist Cathedral in New Westminster. Descent of the Holy Spirit Church in Chilliwack. Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary Church in Richmond. Holy Cross Church in Surrey. And the protection of the Blessed Virgin Mary Church in Vancouver. The last of those is the only one I know. When an eparch was installed there many years ago now, Bishop Yakimishin, eparch Yakimishin, um, the father was editor of the BC Catholic, and the BC Catholic covered the event. So I and other reporters for the BC Catholic spent quite a bit of time in that church. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's at what? Ash and 12th? 14th. Ash and 14th in Vancouver. Again, fully Catholic, Ukrainian Catholic. Then there are the Melkite Catholics, another subdivision of the Byzantine Rite, whose bishop is Eparch Ibrahim Milad El Jawish BS, which stands for Basilian Salvatorian of Senso Verde Marior. Their parish, St. George's Mission, shares St. Francis de Sales Church in Burnaby. And while I was administ uh, administrator of that parish a year or two ago, um, we worked very closely together. And on one or two occasions when there was need, I did baptisms for them. Um, it's interesting. Um, this has nothing to do with Canada now, but perhaps you can hold that up, Father. On the front of the publication from the um, Abbey in Mission, You'll see at Father's left hand, um, Bishop Emeritus David Monroe of Kamloops. Um, on the right hand side, the newly installed Abbot Alban of Mission. And in the middle, Epark Francois Beiruti, who is now the Melkite Epark or Bishop for the whole of the United States. He's based in um, Newton in Massachusetts. Um, Bishop Monroe was at his installation because Bishop Monroe and I remember Epark Beiruti as a little altar boy in St. Edmunds. He and his brother, who has now died, 
were um, especially close to Bishop Monroe. I remember them one day as they were leaving the church, fighting to see who would be out of the church first, and they ended up running. <laughs> now, but it's also interesting because you see the different style of dress. Can you hold it really close, Father? Yeah, you see the head, you see the different headdress of the, the man in the middle, the Epark Beruti. They don't wear a mitre the way our bishops do. But again, to emphasize that, they are fully Catholic in union with the Pope. Anyway. And finally, the Chaldean rite. Again, fully Catholic. Whose bishop is Epoch Robert Said Jarjis of Mar Adai of Toronto. Their parish, St. Paul Chaldean Catholic Parish, share St. Andrew Kim Church in Surrey. These are all places where you could go to Mass on Sunday. Their bishop is valid, their, you know, the, the powers of their bishop are valid, the powers of their parish priest are valid, the Eucharist is the Eucharist. You probably wouldn't understand quite as well what was going on, but you would recognize it. I know when I went to the, in fact, as a child now, I'm just remembering again, we were in St. Peter's in New Westminster, and occasionally, are you because the Ukrainian Catholics have their cathedral in New Westminster, a Ukrainian Catholic priest would say Mass at St. Peter's occasionally. Yeah, I remember some of the differences. Now we come to Protestantism. And you see the word protest. Protestantism, sparked by Martin Luther, I'm just going to go over the dates because they're all about the same time. 1483 to 1546. John Calvin, 1509 to 1564. And Ulrich Zwingli, 1484 to 1531. That is a system of Christian faith and practice based on acceptance of the principles of the Reformation. And this is the wording of the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church. Luther, a German, the son of a minor, was educated at the Cathedral School of Magdeburg at Eisenach and at Erfurt University, where he studied the liberal arts and then law. In 1505, he entered the monastery of the strict Augustinian hermits at Erfurt, in fulfillment of a vow made in terror during a thunderstorm. He was ordained a priest in 1507, just two years later, and the following year sent to lecture on moral philosophy at the recently founded University of Wittenberg. There he became a doctor of theology and professor of scripture, a post he held until his death. The chief factor in the development of Luther's teaching seems to have been his own passionate and melancholy nature. Anxious about his own salvation, anxiety about his own salvation caused him many scruples, and when his religious life failed to bring him confidence and relief, he gave up celebrating Mass and reciting the Liturgy of the Hours. Now, just to emphasize again, this is from the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church under Luther Martin. Zwingli, born in Wildhaus, Switzerland, was educated at Bern, Vienna, and Basel. He was ordained a priest in 1506 and served as pastor of a parish in Glarus for the next 10 years. In 1516, he left for Einsiedeln, where he encountered abuses connected with pilgrimages at the famous shrine. On December 11th, 1518, he was elected People's Preacher at the Old Minster in Zurich, where he remained for the rest of his life, working to implement his political and religious ideals. Again, from the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church. Calvin, born at Noyon in Picardy, France, began his church career at the age of 12. He studied theology in Paris, 1523 to 28. But from 1527 on, he seems to have doubted his priestly vocation 
and probably his Catholic faith. His final break with the church appears to have occurred after a religious experience in 1533. He visited Basel in 1535, intending to devote his life there to study, but on a visit to Geneva in 1536, he agreed to stay to promote the Reformation. His efforts included obliging all Genevans to swear a profession of faith approved by the town council. He was expelled from Geneva in 1538, but returned in 1541 and devoted himself to establishing a theocratic regime based on religion, on Old Testament lines, with dancing and games prohibited and even purely religious offenses severely punished. By 1555, he was the uncontested dictator of the city and remained so until his death. Again, all from the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church. We tried to, we had to condense it, but we had tried to quote it as much as we could to make sure our own biases weren't coming through. <laughs> Apparently, the original purposes of Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin were to reform the Catholic Church, whose practices had indeed become corrupt. As recently as 1378, three men had each claimed to be Pope and excommunicated their rivals. From 1309 to 1376, the Pope, Bishop of Rome, had lived in Avignon in France in scandalous luxury. Popes were installing their children and other relatives in church offices and selling church positions. Priests were abandoning celibacy, which had been mandatory in the Latin Rite since the 11th century. Priests were charging for their services. In fact, the sacrament of the sick was becoming known as the rich man's sacrament. Marital infidelity, illegitimacy, and superstition were common among the laity. And people think that today's problems are universal or well, they unique. they think they're unprecedented. Yes. <laughs> That's the N-word now. Yes. But you see the two subheadings we chose. Reformation appears to have been the original intention, but it became revolution. Instead of to reform... In general, the reformers did not set out to destroy Catholicism or to establish some other united counter-religion, says Catholic historian Hilaire Belloc. Nevertheless, their protests eventually hardened into denials of the authority of the Church, the full implication of membership in Christ's mystical body, the sacrificial character of the Mass, Oh, sorry, I thought there were more in that list. Okay, those are pretty important. Accordingly, the chief characteristics of the original Protestantism, common to all its denominations, came to be... This is the list I was thinking of, and these are from all from the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church. The, so here are the main principles. Scripture alone... In Latin, sola scriptura, that's usually what it's called, meaning acceptance of the Bible as the only source of revealed truth. In contrast, the Catholic Church also recognizes sacred tradition and claims the power and the duty to interpret both authentically. We talked about that in when we talked about divine revelation and what is the Catholic Church. The second principle Faith alone, in Latin, sola fide. The doctrine that we are made just or righteous by faith alone, without any good works, since the deeds of fallen human beings are worthless in God's eyes. In contrast, the Catholic Church holds that our good deeds are meritorious once we have become members of Christ's mystical body at baptism. 
the universal priesthood of believers. The Catholic Church, and that means no need for ordained priests. The Catholic Church teaches that all the baptized do share Christ's priesthood, but that the Mass is a sacrifice which cannot be offered, which can be offered only with an ordained priest. In general, Protestantism tends, and this is again from the Oxford Dictionary, to stress God's transcendence, to emphasize the effects of the fall and original sin, to deny the power of the human intellect to obtain knowledge of God, to minimize liturgy, to put preaching and Bible reading before the sacraments, to reject asceticism for its own sake, but to uphold a high, often austere, standard of personal morality. Asceticism is spiritual effort or exercise in the pursuit of virtue. However, the Protestant principle of private judgment in the interpretation of scripture has led to great variety in doctrine and in practice. For example, the Catholic Church has always held that at the consecration of the Mass, bread and wine are changed substantially in their very being into Christ's body and blood, so that only their appearances remain. In contrast, Luther said, and this is from the Oxford Dictionary again, I keep emphasizing that so that you don't just think we're putting the worst possible face on things. <laughs> In contrast, Luther said that the bread and wine continue to coexist with Christ's body and blood. Zwingli said that the bread and wine are unchanged. Nothing happens. Calvin agreed that the bread and wine are unchanged, but said they communicate the power or virtue of Christ's body and blood. We call the first, Luther's heresy, we call consubstantiation as opposed to the Catholic transubstantiation. We call Calvin's heresy virtualism because of the word he used to describe it. It has been estimated that Protestants today interpret what Christ said at his Last Supper in about a hundred different ways. Some agree with one or other of the Reformers, while others have no communion service at all. Now, Anglicans are often called Protestants, but Anglicans object. Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin left the Catholic Church for religious reasons, doctrinal reasons. But King Henry VIII, about the same time, 1491 to 1547, he separated England from the Church in 1534 for political reasons only. In fact, Henry's book, Defense of the Seven Sacraments Against Martin Luther, had earned him the title Defender of the Faith from Pope Leo X in 1521. Pope Paul III revoked the title in 1543 after Henry had left the church, but the English Parliament re-awarded it to Henry in 1544, and English monarchs still hold it. To this day, British coins are stamped FD for Fidei Defensor, Defender of the Faith. I can no longer read the, the writing on coins. This is a 10 pence coin in the time of Queen Elizabeth, and it says Elizabeth II. DG, that's short for Deo Gratias, thanks be to God. Regina, or REG, so thanks be to God, Queen. FD, Defender of the Faith, Fidei Defensor, 1992. The new coins with, Pope, with 
Charles, I haven't seen one yet. I'm looking I forward to it. I haven't seen one either. Yeah. Presumably they'll have the FD as well. Yeah. Rex instead of Regina. That's right. It won't be R E G. It'll be R E X. King. Yeah. yeah. When Henry's older brother Arthur died in 1502 with no children, Pope Julius II gave Henry a dispensation to marry Arthur's widow, the Spanish princess Catherine of Aragon, who was Catholic. The couple had two children, a son Henry, who lived only seven weeks, and a daughter Mary. However, Henry fell in love with one of his wife's ladies-in-waiting, Anne Boleyn. Moreover, in order to avoid a repetition of the War of the Roses, 1450 to 1485, not very long before Henry's time, he wanted a legitimate male heir. Accordingly, he asked Pope Clement VII to declare his marriage to Catherine null. When the Pope said he could not, Henry had Parliament pass the Act of Supremacy, which stated that, quote, the Bishop of Rome hath not, by scripture, any greater authority in England than any other foreign bishop, and declared the King of England to be sole head of the church in England. Notice, not head of the church of England, but head of the church, the Catholic Church, in England. Like the Protestants at the beginning of the Reformation, Henry had no intention of starting a new church. The Act of Supremacy required anyone holding public or church office to take the Oath of Supremacy. When Bishop John Fisher of Rochester and Lord Chancellor Sir Thomas More refused, Henry had both beheaded. And if you are interested, watch the award-winning movie A Man for All Seasons. Based on Robert Bolt's play of the same name, taken from the records of Will Roper, Moore's son-in-law. As head of the Catholic Church in England, Henry got Archbishop Thomas Cranmer of Canterbury to declare his first marriage null, and he married Anne Boleyn. Anne bore him another daughter, Elizabeth, before he had Anne beheaded on the charge of adultery. In the next few years, Henry suppressed some 600 monasteries. Their ruins are still all over England, some of them very, very beautiful. A number of big English, what you might think would be manors, were actually abbey and still have the name abbey in their name. He suppressed some 600 monasteries, seizing their riches and executing hundreds of bishops, nobles, monks, and laymen and women. However, the only doctrine he ever challenged was the primacy of the Pope. Pretty important. Yeah. And it's interesting because he had first acknowledged the Pope's authority by asking him to declare it null. Yeah. When he said, I can't, he said, he said yeah. who are you? <laughs> yeah. I know. Sad. Let's take a break at that point. After Anne Boleyn's execution, Henry married Jane Seymour, who died in 1537, soon after the birth of a son, Edward VII. I'm just going to mention, because so many people know about this, Henry had no other children, but he married three more times, Anne of Cleves, whom he never lived with, Catherine Howard, whom he beheaded for alleged adultery, and Catherine Parr, who outlived him. Edward was only nine when his father died, so his maternal uncle, Edward Seymour, a Protestant, became regent. During Edward's short reign, 1547 to 1553, the sacrificial character of the mass was denied and cut from the new ordination rite. Throughout England, altars, required for sacrifice, were smashed and replaced with tables for a memorial meal. That was what the Mass was, re was reduced to. 
I'm just going to read um, footnote 78. I was very pleased when I found this. It's from a very old book containing the actual decrees of this time. One of them was, the form of a table shall more move the simple from the superstitious opinions of the Popish Mass unto the right use of the Lord's Supper. For the use of an altar is to make sacrifice upon it. The use of a table is to serve to men to eat for men to eat upon. So it De was a deliberate... Deliberate denial. Yeah, of the sacrificial character of the Mass. Accordingly, Pope Julius III in 1554 and Pope Paul IV in 1555 both declared Anglican ordination null. Remember that a priest is defined to be one who offers sacrifice. And they had denied the whole concept of sacrifice. Okay, when the validity of this declaration was questioned again in the 19th century, Pope Leo XIII decreed that it be once more most carefully examined by a group of competent Catholics, but their conclusion was the same. The Edwardine ordination rite, the Pope said, contained no clear mention of sacrifice, consecration, priesthood, or the power of consecrating and offering sacrifice. Even where parts of the Catholic ordination rite had been retained, every trace of these things had been deliberately removed and struck out. The Edwardine rite of ordaining ministers had been used from 1559 until 1662. After that, the Anglicans had amended it, the Pope noted, but the change had been insufficient and had come too late as a century had already elapsed. For 103 years, Anglican clergymen had been ordained by clerics who had had no intention of conferring priestly powers, the power to offer sacrifice. By 1662 then, the hierarchy had become extinct in England. There remained no power of ordaining. Accordingly, in 1896, Pope Leo reiterated that ordinations carried out according to the Anglican Rite have been, and are, absolutely null and utterly void. And because of this, my mother, who had been raised as an Anglican, her father was an Anglican minister, her, my mother and her mother, my grandmother, and my aunt, all thought, look, if this is what the Pope says, then they recognized that my grandfather, as an Anglican minister, did not have the power to consecrate. And therefore, they all became Catholics. And my grandfather didn't, but he died shortly after. But how important it was, they realized the Either it was the Blessed Sacrament, either it was the body and blood of Christ, or it wasn't. And but not just that, and it was sacrificed in yes, the Mass, or yes, it wasn't. Yes. yes, hence our talk on the Mass as sacrament, sacrament and, and sacrifice. sacrifice. Yeah. And this, by the way, was in 1921. Uh, you probably have no idea of how anti-Catholic England was in those days. I was born in England. I lived there until I was six in the north of England, which had stayed more Catholic than the south because it was farther away from London. And I can remember there was a much more, among Catholics, there was much more consciousness that we are Catholic and not Anglican. We are different. I don't remember, I don't remember any fighting or persecution. I just remember a sense of the difference. And it must have been in fact, you told me once that your mother and her mother and the other and the my other aunt. and your aunt actually moved out of the Anglican presbytery, Rect rectory mm -hmm. to make it easier for their father. Your yeah. poor grandfather, it must have been They were united before he died. Oh lovely. Thank God. But it was he never did become a Catholic, but 
was hard. It's funny, I've just been reading um, a short story by Dorothy Sayers now. She's the first half of the 1900s. But in the story, um, an Anglican clergyman who has started calling himself an Anglican priest and mimicking Catholic ritual um, comes under attack from the local squire. And the squire said, you're just a clergyman. Why this calling yourself a priest? Yes. I mean, the words were different. And I know that when I helped you at the BC Catholic, every time any article came in that referred to an Anglican priest, Father crossed it out and wrote clergyman. Yeah. Now, when Edward VI died unmarried at the age of 16, Catherine's daughter, Mary, Henry's original wife, um, her daughter Mary succeeded him. There were no boys. Mary was Catholic like her Spanish mother, and she tried hard to bring England back to the Catholic faith, putting Protestants to death and earning the title Bloody Mary. For three years, England was reunited with Rome, and Pope Julius III sent Cardinal Reginald Pole to England as his legate. He was actually the last Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury. However, Mary was married to the hated King Philip II of Spain, then England's military and economic enemy, and she failed. When she died in 1558, her half-sister Elizabeth and Boleyn's daughter succeeded her. Elizabeth cut the ties with Rome, abolished the Mass, and declared herself supreme governor of the church in England. But still considering themselves Catholic in a sense. I'm not sure by that point. But, but the church, the church was the, the church. Catholic church in England, not church of England at that point. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure quite what was in her mind. Yeah. Um, the 39 Articles of Anglican Belief promulgated in 1663 that's in the reign of King James the, I think I'm right, King James the First, affirmed sola scriptura, scripture alone, and denied Catholic teaching about purgatory, transubstantiation, the sacrifice of the mass, the authority of the church, and the seven sacraments. So the break is pretty complete. In 1570, Pope Pius V declared Queen Elizabeth excommunicate. Now, I edited this last year, and I didn't edit it very well. That sentence should read, Pope Pius V deca declared Queen Elizabeth and all Anglicans excommunicate, and the Queen began to actively suppress all non-Anglicans. From 1584 on, it was high treason to be a Catholic priest in England. The penalty was death by hanging, drawing, and quartering. So I, in England, would be put to death. Yeah. You hanged, were, drawn, and quartered. Not very really nice. It's, it's an expression Mother used to use for fun. You were hanged until you were almost dead. Then you were cut down, cut open, and your intestines drawn out. It's pretty nasty. Um, if you'd like to, I think it's a fascinating book, Richard Challoner, Memoirs of Missionary Priests. But for a first-hand ac hand account of England under Elizabeth, see John Gerard, S.J. He lived from 1564, that's after the Act of Supremacy, until 1637. He called it Autobiography of a Hunted Priest. He was ordained for the English mission with the intention of going back into England in disguise to minister to those who had remained Catholic, mostly in the north of England, which is where I come from. And there were many large families in northern England that remained Catholic. Yeah. Well, the Dukes of Norfolk, I believe, are still Catholic. Yes. And it was um, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, the two wives of Henry VIII whom he beheaded, who were related to the Duke of Norfolk. In fact, if you watch A Man for All Seasons, the Duke of Norfolk at that time was the Howard, who had been a friend of Thomas's. He's a, a main character in it. It's, um, it's very interesting. 
Um, this was the time when priests' hiding holes were built in English manors, in English big houses. One of the Jesuit brothers, Nicholas Owen, now Saint Nicholas Owen, um, designed them. And uh, Father Gerard speaks about one in the north of England where he was saying mass one day and the soldiers hammered on the door. And knowing what they were there for, they blew out the candles and he got into a priest's hiding hole which was located under a false fireplace. Now, John Gerard was a very tall man. When they tortured him by hanging him from his thumbs, he said they had to dig out the floor so that he was hanging. So he got into this space. The soldiers came in. They smelled the wax of the candles which had just been blown out. They realized that a priest had been there saying mass. And so they decided to wait him out. And they didn't realize that the fireplace was false. So they lit a fire in it. And he said he had to crouch to one side. He was standing up in this place. He had to crouch to one side to avoid the falling um, coals, the hot coals. Because the only breathing hole was the... Uh... And all he had yeah. to eat was a jar of quince jelly that his hostess had thrust on him as he got into the hole. His hostess was, as he calls her, Mistress Anne Lyne, now Saint Anne Lyne. Anyway, just a few years ago, well, a few decades ago now, but in the last century, in the, 20, in the 1900s, they found this hole. Um, they hadn't found it till then. And sure enough, at the bottom of it are some coals. coals. Yeah. And outside in the garden, my sister told me this, she follows this kind of thing quite um, avidly, there is a very old, centuries old, quince tree. Now, Father's carrying on the, the tradition by making quince jelly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's a fascinating story to read, a true story, but it reads like a modern spy story. These things are fairly recent when you think of the yeah. history of the church yeah. since the time of Christ. Um, John, Father John Gerard was captured and put in the tower and tortured, um, but he managed to escape um, by making use of a jailer who didn't know how to read. And when he did escape, he made sure that the jailer was could escape with him because so that he wouldn't be blamed for his own escape but it's a fascinating story the book's still in print you can you can order it online anglicans claim to have avoided what they call the additions of romanism and the subtractions of protestantism they regard themselves as subtractions one... really there would be heresies yeah yeah taking away they regard themselves as one of four branches of Christendom, along with Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and Old Catholics, which is a rather small group that broke away at the First Vatican Council. In the United States, the Anglican Church is called Episcopalian because, unlike many Protestant denominations, it still has bishops. Episcopos is the Greek for bishop. Worldwide, the Anglican Church now holds such a range of belief that it is more often called the Anglican Communion. It includes High Anglicans who appear to differ from Catholics on little except papal primacy. Now, if they've been ordained in the Anglican Church, we believe they don't have valid orders. But they, all their ritual is very similar to Catholic ritual. So it's more confusing to a lot of people. Well... I believe, too, a number of Anglican clergymen, high Anglican clergymen, to make sure they're ordained properly, have actually gone to these others, Eastern Orthodox and Old Catholics, to be ordained. Yes. So that legitimate, so that valid orders are handed on. And some of them, really, like recognizing their closeness, have come to Rome and submitted yep. and in union now. Yeah. Then there are low or evangelical Anglicans who rely fundamentally on the Gospels, the Bible, whom Catholics would call Protestants. And there are broad or modernist Anglicans who accept Christ's divinity only vaguely, if at all. 
In recent years, the Anglican Communion has moved further away from the Catholic Church by the Church of England's decisions to ordain women priests, we would say women clergymen, and bishops. One of those decisions taken in 1992 and the other in 2014. So it's virtually yesterday. The schisms that separated whole communities from the Catholic Church were caused by sin, for which often enough men of both sides were to blame. However, those brought up in such communities today cannot be held guilty of the sin. Accordingly, the Catholic Church accepts them with respect and affection. If they have been properly baptized, they belong to Christ's mystical body, so they are rightly called Christians and Catholics accept them as brothers in the Lord. The Church asserts that much truth and holiness, including faith, hope, charity, supernatural life, and the written word of God, can be found in these churches and ecclesial communities, and that Christ's Spirit uses them as means of salvation. However, she maintains that their effectiveness comes from the fullness of grace and truth that Christ has entrusted to the Catholic Church. Now, just for, completion, for completeness, we'll say a couple of words about non-Christian religions. First, Judaism. It was the Jews whom God first chose as his people. The first Christians were Jews who recognized Jesus as the promised Messiah. Accordingly, when Pope John Paul II visited Rome's principal Jewish synagogue in April 1986, he called the Jews our elder brothers in the faith. At every Mass, we say Abraham, our, or is it just in the first Eucharistic prayer? Abraham, our father in faith. To the Jews belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the law-giving, the worship, and the promises, St. Paul said. Moreover, God's gifts and his call are irrevocable, St. Paul says. In compiling the Bible, therefore, the Catholic Church included the Jewish scriptures, which Christians call the Old Testament. Today, both Christians and Jews await the Messiah, but Christians recognize him as Jesus, Lord and Son of God, who died and rose from the dead 2,000 years ago, while to Jews his features remain hidden till the end of time. Then Islam. Muhammad, born about 570, lived in Mecca in Saudi Arabia, where the people were mostly polytheists. They believed in many gods. He claims that, claimed that for about 20 years, God, whom he called Allah, and the angel Gabriel appeared to him and dictated the 200,000-word Koran. In contrast, Christians claim that with Christ, God's self-revelation is complete. For what God revealed partially and gradually through the prophets of the Old Testament, he revealed fully all at once in Christ his Son. There has been no new revelation. There never could be. The Koran mainly maxims grouped in 114 chapters, expresses the simple theology of Islam, that there is only one God, Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Many years ago now, one of my grade 11 students said, look, Mrs. Creelman, he just got his driver's license. But the, his name was preceded by a word, Sayed, and I said, is that your first name? He said, no, that means I'm related to God. I said, how can you be related to God? I said, I'm a Christian. I believe God became man. I could be related to him, but how can you be? So he said, oh, but one of the other students who was also Muslim, we have a lot of Iranians on the North Shore. He said, it, he should have said, he's related to the prophet, Muhammad. So this student who just got his license said, it's the same thing. I said, no, it isn't. <clears throat> and I came out with the one bit of Islam that I know. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. 
and the whole class, it seemed to me, broke out clapping. She knows. <laughs> they knew I was Catholic, by the way. Muslims who claim to hold the faith of Abraham, they read the Old Testament in their services, adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge on the last day. They reject the doctrine of the Holy Trinity and the Incarnation, but they honor Jesus as a prophet and Mary as his mother. Then other religions. Both Jews and Muslims are monotheistic, that is, they worship the one true God. However, even in non-monotheistic religions, the Church recognizes a search for God. She considers all goodness and truth found in them to be God's gift and a preparation for the Gospel. So just to reiterate, our subject matter today is divisions among Christians, and here the last three categories we've been looking at non-Christians, but because of the importance and the recognition of their existence to make this more complete. Now let's consider church authority today. Rifts arose in the early church, which St. Paul strongly censures as damnable. Eventually, large communities became separated from full communion with the Catholic Church. As we have seen, there were many different reasons, but every disagreement necessarily included a denial of the Church's authority. Even That's today, always where it comes to. Always what yeah. it comes down to, yeah. Christ gave the Church authority, Christ gave Peter authority, and if you deny that, you can go in any direction you want. Even today, the Church teaches authoritatively. For example, consider what Pope John Paul II said. Just, we put this in for the language, not the content. Just listen to the language. In order that all doubt may be removed regarding a matter of great importance, a matter which pertains to the Church's divine constitution or makeup itself, in virtue of my ministry of confirming the brethren, that's what Christ said to Peter, I declare that the Church has no authority whatsoever to confer priestly ordination on women and that this judgment is to be definitively held by all the Church's faithful. can't imagine more clear and stronger language. And more authoritative yeah. language. Yeah. By these words, the Supreme Pontiff John Paul II expressly intends to fulfill his office as successor of Peter, confirming the Church's teaching by virtue of his apostolic ministry. That was the Vatican statement about that document. Yeah. When non-Catholic Christians are received into full communion with the Catholic Church, they declare formally, I believe and profess all that the Holy Catholic Church believes, teaches, and proclaims to be revealed by God. And all Catholics should be ready to say the same. To dissent is, by definition, to be a Protestant. And it doesn't say that you understand everything, or that you're, no. you're not a sinner, or you're not weak, or you may not fall. But I believe that the Church has the right to speak, and I believe what it says. Yep. Now, ecumenism. It comes from the... Greek okumene, the whole inhabited world. Ecumenism is the modern movement toward Christian unity. Protestants began it at the Edinburgh World Missionary Conference in 1910. The Catholic Church began it at the Second Vatican Council in 1964 and restated its Catholic principles with the declaration Dominus Jesus, the Lord Jesus, in 2000. We must all work to recover the unity of Christians, each according to our own gifts, through mutual knowledge. Thank God I knew that tenet of Islam. Yes. <laughs> through meetings, instruction, conversion of hearts, permanent renewal in the church, prayer and social service in common. I know you said, Father, how... Um, 
how close you felt to Christians from other denominations when you were in prison for blocking access to an abortion clinic. Yes. Because it wasn't just a Catholic move. It was, yeah. Yeah. Prayer and social service in common and dialogue among theologians. There are signs of hope. In 1964, Pope Paul VI and Orthodox Patriarch Athenagoras met on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem and committed the Catholic Orthodox excommunications of 1054 to oblivion. In Isn't 20... that wonderful? Yeah. A thousand years later almost. Yeah. In 2014, Pope Francis marked the 50th anniversary of that event by meeting Orthodox Patriarch Bartholomew in Jerusalem. In between, there had been 17 meetings between the Vatican and Constantinople. Trying to work, yep. both sides, sincerely, trying to work for unity. It's good. Ever since 1964, on November 30th, the Feast of St. Andrew, revered as founder of the Greek-speaking churches, the Vatican sends a message to the Orthodox, personally delivered by the Pope or a top Vatican delegate during ceremonies in Istanbul. The Orthodox reciprocate on June 29th, the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul, revered as founders of the Church at Rome. In 1995, as I mentioned earlier, the Vatican concluded that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone as the Orthodox say, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, as Catholics say, may both express the truth if the words translated proceeds actually have different meanings. Now, we put a summary of this agreement, this explanation, um, in our talk on God, Unity, and Trinity, Appendix 2. Um, when the document came out, I read it, but I must warn you that if you don't know Greek or Latin, you need to know both, actually. You're going to have trouble reading it, <laughs> but you might like to read the, um, the summary of it. But so often, when there's a disagreement between people, it's because they don't really know what the other person is saying, yeah. or they're, they're talking... A slight, just a slightly different interpretation of the same word and they have a different meaning for that word yeah. and therefore it's so often and this is the case with, with a lot of human conflicts yeah yeah it's in fact the I, need to just I sometimes mean, I pause thought, I thought you were going to say something different you said in so many conflicts you know we don't understand what the other is saying there are conflicts right now um, I've just been facing one over the last couple of weeks, and I've run into three people who are furious about something. And in each case, I said to them, have you read the original document? No. I know what it says, though. I know. We have to stress again, don't get your information about Catholic affairs from the secular media. Because, as Father just said, they don't use words in the same way. They don't know what we mean by certain words, and they use them in their sense when they're not actually lying or trying to bring down, trying to destroy what the church has and said. And most people are not. They're sincere. Yeah, I think so. I don't think all journalists yeah. are telling lies. But it's not difficult to give the wrong impression if you haven't read the original document and made sure that you understand the words. Anyway, please, God. Uh, I'll bet if I were giving a... Uh an announcement about a football game, I might say something about the umpire. They don't have them. Oh, don't they? <laughs> well, you could have strung me no, along. No, but you know, I mean, you could go... Yeah, so if yeah. you start using the word, then yeah. people are going to say, but you're talking a different language. Yeah. In 2007, the Orthodox stated that, quote, primacy at all levels is a practice firmly grounded in the canonical tradition of the church including primacy at the universal level, even though the manner in which it is to be exercised and its scriptural and theological foundations are still understood differently. Which is exactly what you were saying. Yeah. 
1999, the Lutheran World Federation and the Catholic Church stated that they now share a common understanding of our justification by God's grace through faith in Christ. In 2008, the World Methodist Conference joined them. Among Protestants, the World Council of Churches, the World Evangelical Alliance, and the Pentecostal Charismatic Movement are all working for unity among non-Catholic Christians. It was wonderful, I think it was 1983, that the World Council of Churches met in, in Vancouver. And we worked together, a number of us different, from different denominations, worked together very closely. Many people, through no fault of their own, do not know Christ or his church. Even those who could be expected to know, often in truth, do not. I'm just looking at footnote 131. Um, Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, now blessed Fulton Sheen, he said in one of his radio replies, there are not over a hundred people in the United States who hate the Catholic Church. There are millions, however, who hate what they wrongly believe to be the Catholic Church. Such people can achieve salvation by sincerely seeking God and trying to do his will as they know it through the dictates of their conscience. For in ways he knows, God can lead them to that faith without which it is impossible to please him. Many people who do know Christ and his church are not formally Catholic. Such people can be saved by a grace that enlightens them in a way appropriate to their spiritual and material situation. For we cannot exclude the action of Christ and the Spirit outside the Church's visible boundaries. Nevertheless, there is only one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. There is no parallel or complementary mediation but only participation in his. The grace that enlightens anyone comes from him. It is the result of his sacrifice and is communicated by the Holy Spirit. Moreover, its efficacy, its effectiveness, comes from the fullness of grace and truth entrusted to the Catholic Church. In this sense, this is something you have to understand carefully, in that sense, we can say that outside the church, there is no salvation. For the Lord Jesus continues his presence and his work of salvation in the church and by means of the church, which is his body. We must never think, therefore, that all religions may be equally valid ways of salvation. In fact, no one could be saved who knew that Christ had founded the Catholic Church and refused either to enter it or to remain in it. God the Father wants to call the whole of humanity together into his Son's Church, where it will rediscover its unity and salvation. Accordingly, the Church has the obligation and the right to evangelize, and so do all her members. On the last day, Jesus will say to those who have neglected the corporal works of mercy, Out of my sight you condemned, into that everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. Might he not? So this is sheer speculation. Just to make a point, this is not church teaching. Might he not say something similar? To those who have neglected the spiritual works of mercy? I was unenlightened, and you did not enlighten me. I was ignorant, and you gave me no instruction. What, an, what a caution to us to proclaim the truth. Here, the Pope has a special role. Pope John Paul II called himself the first servant of unity. I am convinced that I have a particular responsibility in this regard, he said. Above all, to find a way of exercising the primacy, which, while in no way renouncing what is essential to its mission, is nonetheless open to a new situation. 
For a whole millennium, Christians were united in a fraternal, brotherly communion of faith and sacramental life, he said. If disagreements in belief and discipline arose among them, the Roman see acted by common consent as moderator. In this way, the primacy exercised its office of unity. For a great variety of reasons, and against the will of all concerned, what should have been a service sometimes manifested itself in a very different light, he said. But I recognize that as Bishop of Rome, I am called to exercise that ministry. I insistently pray the Holy Spirit to shine his light upon us, enlightening all the pastors and theologians of our churches, that we may seek, together of course, the forms in which this ministry may accomplish a service of love recognized by all concerned. Pope Francis says the same. It is my duty as the Bishop of Rome to be open to suggestions that can help make the exercise of my ministry more faithful to the meaning that Jesus Christ wished to give it and to the present needs of evangelization. Ultimately, however, Uniting Christians in the one and only Church of Christ transcends human powers. We place all our hope in the prayer of Christ for the Church, in the love of the Father for us, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we said this was just going to be a history of the divisions among Christians. And Cardinal Newman now, St. John Henry Newman said, History is not a creed or a catechism. It gives lessons rather than rules. However, to be deep in history is to cease to be a Protestant. You have to, rem well, I don't know if you have to remember because I'm not sure how many people know, but he was the founder of what became known as the Oxford Movement because he was an Anglican clergyman at the University of Oxford, he wanted to put on a solid basis the Anglican claim to be one of four valid branches of Christendom, of Catholicism, I should say. He went into it in great depth, ended up becoming a Catholic. So did many other Oxford groupers, as they call them. When he was about 45, he lived to 91, so halfway through his life. Yeah. Lead kindly light, lead thou me on, and he's, as he's searching for the truth and yeah. trying to find it. So in the bibliography are the volumes that we've consulted. Patrick Madrid is the editor of three books now called Surprise by Truth, one, two, and three. Fairly short stories by people who have become Catholic as adults, people who, some of whom were Protestants before that, some of whom were Jews, some of whom had no belief in God whatsoever. But it, I remember, I'm not quoting exactly, but I remember, I think more than one, but certainly one Protestant who said, I believed what my pastor was telling me on Sundays. But I knew that down the road, another pastor was telling his congregation something different. And he said, I started, so what, what did the church say in the beginning? He said, I was a Presbyterian. I wanted to find out what the original Presbyterian church had said. So I went back into the early years of Christianity. And he said, to my surprise, what I found was not the early Presbyterian church, but the early Catholic Church. He ended up becoming a Catholic. Now, we've got a... I don't know how many appendices we've got. Just one, I think. Just one, yes. Okay, on page 430. The Vatican Summary of Dominus Jesus, the Lord Jesus. Edited slightly for ease of reading. When these things are translated into English, they sometimes have grammatical errors in them. Which, Con convoluted statements. convoluted statements, yeah. which I change. If you ever want, you know, if I, I always make the note, edited slightly for ease of reading. By all means, go to vatican.va and look up the original. But this is, I think, as far as I can tell. I mean, certainly intended to be absolutely true to the original. Yeah. 
um, worth reading. And that's the only one we've got? Yes. yes. Oh, I'm going to say one more thing. The Dominus Jesus making definite statements about what we believe the Catholic Church to be aroused a lot of antagonism. Oh, this is destroying ecumenism, as though ecumenism is somehow an ignoring of differences. And not very long after it was published, Pope John Paul said, with the Declaration Dominus Jesus, approved by me in a special way at the height of the Jubilee year, I want to invite all Christians to renew their fidelity to him in the joy of faith and to bear unanimous witness that the Son, both today and tomorrow, is the way, the truth, and the life. Our confession of Christ as the only Son, through whom we see the Father's face, is not arrogance that disdains other religions, but joyful gratitude that Christ has revealed himself to us without any merit on our part. At the same time, he has obliged us to continue giving what we have received and to communicate to others what we have been given, since the truth that is given and the love that is God belongs to all people. Okay, well, good. This week in the uh, scripture reading, we're moving on into the book of Daniel, chapters 1 to 14. And you'll see how the three young men prepare, preferred death by fire to the abundant to the abandonment of their of God's will. If our God, whom we serve, can save us from the white hot furnace, and from your hands, O King, may He save us. They said, but even if He will not save us. Know, O king, that we will not serve your God or worship the golden statue that you have set up. So next week we will discuss just what we mean by God's will. That's the subject matter. God's will or the will of God. In the meantime... So that'll be Lent by then. Yes, I think so. In the meantime, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. You're welcome.